Hello, Hello everyone. Just uh, checking, can you hear me in the back? Yes. Sir. Excellent. Can I hear you in the back, Mika? Yes. I hear you, Anders. Yeah. I hear you. Good, because I'm going to ask some questions and I don't want to miss out on what you're having to say in the back. Um, DSL design. Uh, simple is in the eye of the beholder. What is simple uh, when it comes to DSL design? That is what I'm going to talk about. Um, why do we want to create a DSL, a domain specific language? Well, apart from it sounding very exciting after hearing all these other people talk about it, um, we want to address a small and well defined domain, uh, basically to keep the task manageable. But uh, perhaps more importantly, we want to make life easy for, but not life in general, programming life easy for business or domain experts or non-programmers in general, but also for programmers who want to focus on uh, not the accidental complexity of the systems that we're building, but on the inherent complexity, the complexity that, that actually follows from the, from the problem domain. That is what is important. So with the DSL, uh, regular programmers can actually focus on the right things. So for a developer, a DSL can make her or him a lot faster, 20 times faster perhaps. And for a non-developer, a DSL can enable him or her to do things that they couldn't do before. Which are, it's very, very powerful and something that we should not underestimate. Now, the path to a domain-specific language is not straight. Um, first of all, there's really no finish even though the picture shows it, because a domain-specific language, language will always evolve, because your users, the DSL programmers, they will have new needs, and they might find new and better ways of doing things that you want to incorporate into your domain-specific language. There are lots of decisions that you need to make on the way. Um, so how do we do them, and where do we even start? Well, there are a number of very important things that we need to do first. And one of those is to decide if the domain-specific language should be internal or external. An internal DSL is something that is expressed within a host language. And some popular languages that are used to create DSLs are Ruby and Kotlin. And when you're in a DSL in a host language, you're really writing code in the host language, but in like a subset of it, in a, in a subset that is especially designed to be domain specific. Whereas in an external DSL, you can, you're free to do anything. It's just text or, as we will see later on, perhaps something visual. But in any case, you're not limited to anything. It's free form. And that means that you can adapt it exactly to your needs. You can create something that exactly fits the problem domain and what you need to express in that domain. The backside, of course, is that you're on your own when it comes to tooling. You need to develop your tools, um, your compiler support and your editor support. Uh, luckily, as Marcus showed us, it's not that hard. You just use Antler and a language server protocol and, you know, that's it. <laughs> and you can... <laughs> and then you just call Marcus and, and he will help you fill in the blanks. Um, I'm going to talk about or use as example an external DSL because I think that's more interesting because then we're not limited to something. Martin Fowler says in the book Domain Specific Languages that the overall goal for a DSL as with any writing is clarity for the reader. So readability is very very important. Martin Ward says that it's also important that the language should be conceptually simple, easy to parse by humans and computers. Again, readability. This is from the language-oriented programming paper. So I think readability is, of course, a very important um, property of a DSL. But there are others as well. There's writability. We must be able to write a program in the domain specific language and we must be able to remember what was the syntax, what were we going to, to write so that we don't have to look up the syntax each time. 
And we want the domain-specific language to be powerful because we want to express, be able to express everything in the problem domain. So that we don't have a problem domain and with the domain-specific language we can express like half of it because then it's, it's not useful. I should also mention that when it comes to readability, what we're really talking about is of course comprehensibility, that it should be comprehensible. We want people to be able to comprehend it because I suppose most people can read any text. The question is whether or not they actually understand what it says. So simple then, is it just readable plus writable? Perhaps, if we have something that is readable and then it's writable, then it's, it's simple. But the question is, what is simple? And the answer to that is that it depends. It depends on the target audience. Who are, are our DSL programmers? Are they domain experts, business experts? Or are they programmers? And depending on the answer to that question, your DSL should look uh, probably different. So, the things I want to talk about today are verbosity, meaning how much we have to type approximately when we write a program in our DSL. Symbols, because we all have symbols, right? They're concise and expressive. I want to talk about natural language, because natural language is, is, uh, is wonderful. Um, it's uh, clear, it's unambiguous, it's precise. We know exactly what we mean at all times. And I want to talk about localization. You know, Kjoda på svenska, writing programs in, in different language, translating programs. And finally, some words on domain specific language versus uh, general purpose language. And my, my goal is here to to give you some inspiration on what a language, a domain specific language could look like by looking at other languages. How do they do it? And what do we have to, to um, uh, where can we get inspiration? To do that, I need an example. I need some sort of uh, DSL for illustration purposes, just to show you um, something, uh, I mean, not JSON, but something else. Uh, and I thought, why not use a DSL for creating presentations? So a, a presentation DSL where I can write my presentation and then just generate a PowerPoint. This presentation is not generated by my presentation DSL. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is, uh, but that's the next step, I think. Um, and just quickly, to behind the domain specific language you need, you need something called a semantic model. You need a model that the domain specific language maps to. And for my presentation DSL I want a model where I have um, the, the concept of a presentation. A presentation contains slides and each slide has a title and a layout and with layout I mean which master slide does it, does it use. Is it a title slide or is it a um, uh, bullet and heading, or is it something else? And then the slide has a body, and the body consists of text, and uh, most important of all, we need animations, because, you know, otherwise it's not a real presentation, is it? An animation can have an effect, um, which means like fly in, appear, swivel, sort of like that, and a trigger, um, which is click in this case, and it can have a duration. So, my first attempt at creating a domain specific language for this was actually just plain XML. And if you think about it, XML is one of the most common domain specific languages like ever probably, because there, there are a lot of configuration files that are express, expressed in XML. And if you write configuration in a configuration file, you're actually using the configuration domain specific language for whatever tool you're configuring. So XML is a very common DSL. So I have my presentation, I have just one slide here. Um, that's all I, you know, I didn't come farther than that. I have my title, I have my body and text. I don't have animations in here yet. 
The, the problem with my first attempt, I think, is that it's quite verbose because I have all these um, uh, less than, slash, and greater than, and I have the end tags and so on. So there's a lot of things in here that are not related to, to actually the contents. Um, I also have trouble uh, coming up with a good way of getting animations in because as you maybe remember from the previous slide, animation was like a property of, of the text, right? So should I then have an attribute for that or should I rather use an element? I'm not sure. So when I thought about this, I realized that I don't think uh, XML is a good good um, DSL for my presentation, uh, or a good way of expressing my presentation DSL. So I want to, to do something else. So as I mentioned, it's verbose. And verbosity is of course bad. Because if something is verbose, then the programmer, the DSL user, has to type more than is necessary. There will be things that she or he types that are not necessary for or that are not related to the content. But verbosity is also good, because if something is verbose, then the reader can look at it and easier understand what's going on, because there will be more information that helps the reader understand things. So we have a duality here, bad verbosity and good verbosity. And I mean, if you, if you talk to a, 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 a programmer, then the programmer will likely say that verbosity is bad because I just want to use uh, type as little as possible. But if you talk to um, like a, a business person, then perhaps they, they like their verbosity because it becomes very clear. So again, we need to keep in mind who is our target audience. Let's look at some examples of verbosity. This is uh, C sharp. So we have a simple if statement. Uh, if we're looking at a, a boolean variable here, and um, there's, a, uh, there's a block. And I mean, technically, you know that we don't need the curly braces because it's only one statement here in the, in the block. So we could omit them. Um, if we instead look at um, Visual Basic, we have this. So now, instead of the curly braces, we have then and end if. I also added a, a clearer comparison here, if conference time equals true. Uh, it's a bit more verbose, but it's also clearer that uh, there's a comparison going on. I also skipped indentation because since we have uh, a clear way of starting the block and a clear way of ending the block, there's actually no need for white space, it's only you know, noise. Although it of course helps with understanding the structure. And the third version is Python, which uses indentation. So we don't have something to end the if statement. We say if, and then we have a colon, and then we use indentation to show that here's a block. So here we have three different ways of uh, expressing basically the same thing. Which do you think is the easiest to read? Visual basic. Visual basic. Good. Any other? Python. Python. Okay. Anyone C sharp? No? <laughs> I mean, the, the beauty of C sharp, of course, is that curly braces are concise. They're easy to type, unless, of course, you're a PC person trying to use a Mac keyword, in which it's, in case it's impossible to type. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, the problem with curly braces is, is that they are pretty, pretty anonymous. If you just see a, a, an end curly brace here, you don't know what's going on. So in this case, uh, some guy on, on, on GitHub wrote 330 lines of code and then had to like, you know, close all the blocks and arrays and whatnot. And just by looking at that, you don't really know where things begin. But if you use the VB version, we have end if and uh, other um, what do you say, end loop or something, then it's very clear which control uh, statement is it that I'm ending here. Now, a uh, completely different approach is, of course, to use palindromization. So in Bash, you would say if, then, and then phi, 
which is, I mean, beautiful, right? Just take the first word and reverse it. It's a case statement in Bash ends with ESSAC. Very easy. If you show the while loop, then it tells you what it is. Sorry? If you sh show the while loop, then the end phrase should tell you how people find this. Is it the while loop in Bash, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> do odd. It's odd. Yeah, but there's also do dumb. Yep. They, they, um, yeah. Do they have do odd as well? I think, oh, that's Elbow 68. Where <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Uh, so palindromization, uh, the reversal of keywords, and I think this is this is uh, neat. The thus if statements can be terminated with phi more prettily and economically than with end if. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> and we have case esac for roth and while elew, which uh, I have never used. So I um, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think this yeah, this is. Um, but in batch we have while do done as well because the the loops are do done for some reason okay. or it so press that uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and I also mentioned um, uh, you saw the Python variant the Python Python version uh, in Python we we use annotation uh, to show a block. Uh, we have CoffeeScript, which also is white space sensitive, so uh, we use uh, annotation to show a block. And the interesting thing about CoffeeScript is that it doesn't matter how much you, you indent, right? So you can write this code and it's perfectly valid. So we have one, three, seven, and then 11 spaces. Should we allow that in our DSL? Uh, I'm not sure. I think something stricter than this uh, is actually a, a good thing to have. Um, so, there are different kinds of verbosity, things we have to type that don't add value, so boilerplate basically, and personally I think all the end, end uh, tags in XML and HTML are like that, and we even, I mean the editors nowadays, they, they compensate for that verbosity by just filling in the end for you, but if we send a DSL, do we want to, you know, have, need to have compensation in our editors? Not sure. But, but we can also try to make it clearer for our readers by using some sort of um, uh, clarity in our, in our uh, DSL. Now when it comes to the presentation DSL, um, I actually thought that I want to, I don't want to use XML, so I want to have the, the bare keywords, but I actually like the Python variant very much. Um, and I think it's very readable to just go for indentation uh, because we can visually see where things end. Uh, just by looking at this. So I have the presentation, the slide, the layout, title and body and text. And, and uh, two spaces because obviously that's the best choice. Um, the problem here then is how do I fit animations into that? That was a problem with XML as well, but now when I have this structure I need to th think about animations. And Animations in my model was like an attribute of the text. You have a text and you want to animate it. It's something related to the text. And I know, do you like CSS? Like uh, cascading style sheets for, you know. Um, so perhaps we could borrow some syntax from CSS and say that we have a text and then we use the bang, the exclamation mark, and say animate, and then we type the the, um, uh, the parameters here appear, click, and 0.5 seconds. Now I want to ask you, how do you read that symbol? Not. Yeah. <laughs> Not. Anyone else? Yeah. Plink. Hmm? Plink. Plink? Uh, oh, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was prepared for not, but not plink. Factorial. Yeah, yeah, could be. There are a lot of possible interpretations, of course. And this... What, what if, if your text ends with an exclamation mark? Maybe like you have to say, Burger! Yes, yes. <laughs> that is not supported. That is not supported in the detail. <laughs> You're not... No uh, emotional outbursts <laughs> are supported in this DSL. No, no. 
strictly professional here. Um, <laughs> but this, anyway, um, uh, leads us to the next part, uh, that is symbols. So symbols allow us to be concise because we can use like a single character to encode a lot of information. And that works really well as long as the symbols are known. Uh, because if you show a symbol to someone who doesn't, isn't aware of the context, the meaning of the symbol, then it's just you know, gibberish. Uh, and of course it affects comprehensibility a lot. If you look at a text with a lot of symbols, it may be hard to like, decode unless you're very familiar with it. And if we get back to animate, I mean what I borrowed from CSS is obviously the uh, important keyword. So in CSS you, you write a rule and if you want to say that this rule is the most important rule of all rules, it overrides everything else, and then you type uh, the bang and then important. Uh, so in this case it's something positive, it's an exc exclamation. And actually we have natural languages that do that as well. Spanish does it, for example. And do you know why Spanish does it? Es importante? Here, there's an upside down exclamation mark in the beginning. It's just so you know from the beginning that this is something that is going to be an explanation and you can now affect your pronunciation and such, st I stuff like that. I <laughs> could do that as well. <laughs> yeah. That's another valid explanation, I think. Mm. Uh, the problem is that a programmer, like Eric, might read it as not, uh, not important. So if you show this in CSS to a programmer, and that programmer will say, okay, so this rule is not important. Well, the opposite of what it meant, not good. Or in, in the case of representation DSL, they may think, do not animate. Um, which also would be weird, because then why would I parameterize it with duration and stuff like that. So as always, context is king. Because if you think about it, a programmer wouldn't say uh, in a shell script that this is the negation of the end of the command or something. In this context, the, the bang doesn't mean not, obviously. Or an HTML comment is not read as less than not minus minus. I mean, in this, in this context, the the, um, the bang has a very specific meaning, and, and people who are used to, to writing this kind of things, they, they know that, of course. How do you read the following? What is that? Syntax syntax error. Error. <laughs> okay, so it's either a range or syntax error. So we have math people and programmers, <laughs> right? So for math people, this is an open-ended range. Um, where meaning basically that for a number x, um, 0 is less than or equal to x, and x is less than 1. Uh, but for a programmer, this doesn't compile because we haven't balanced our, our uh, symbols correctly. But it's really interesting, I mean, where you come from uh, has a, a big uh, impact on how you interpret uh, parts of, uh, of a program. So when we design our DSL, we need to think about this. Who is our target audience? Are they programmers? Uh, then perhaps we shouldn't express ranges like this. Are they math people? Then this is probably very good. So I think it's good to use symbols carefully. Um, if you think a symbol is good, like when I thought that, well, the bang animate, that's an excellent symbol, and then I show this to someone and they think, hmm, not. And this is, I think, related to what I know talked about before, which is chunking. Because if you're a programmer and you have seen the symbol, the bang symbol, and you've like chunked it into a, a concept that is about negating things, um, then when you see that symbol somewhere else, that like chunk becomes active and then you get the idea that this is about negating, although the context is different. So we need to think about these memory mechanisms when we design our DSL. Uh, I also think it's good to stick to one syntax and not like mix uh, symbols and non-symbols too much. Uh, who here are PowerShell gurus? experts, 
Anders, don't be shy. <laughs> PowerShell is one of those languages that I, I think I know it. And every time I try to write something, I realize that, that it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to programming language, but it's too different to be, so that I also always um, uh, make mistakes. There's a, a commandlet called get process, and we can pipe the result of uh, get process into for each object, and then we can just uh, take the name from there. So this is like like link select or something. We get the name of all the processes printed on the console. Uh, we can also instead of for each object use a symbol, the percentage, and then uh, get the name. Or instead of the dollar underscore, we can use dollar piece item to do the same thing. Or, instead of for each object or, or uh, uh, the percentage sign, we can use the for each alias. It's an alias for for each object. Or, we can use for each object and then input object and then type get process here to get the names. But we cannot omit the parentheses here, because in this case there will, will be no output. And if you try to use for each to the left, it's just a syntax error. Because for each here is an alias for for each object, but here it's not an alias for for each object. Here it's a command, and the command doesn't understand input objects. So here you have to type this instead. So I mean, if we have one, two, three, four, eight ways of which two are useless, and also PowerShell is case insensitive, so we can use uppercase variants as well. So in this case, is, is, is this good? Is it good to have these many ways of expressing the same thing? I don't think so. I think when we design uh, DSL, we need to be a little bit strict and limit uh, the expressiveness, so there is like one single way of expressing that, the thing that we want to express. Stick to one syntax. Um, I think in our presentation DSL, the introduction of the bang and the animate, I mean, to use the CSS syntax, CSS syntax changes the, the, um, the shape of the DSL. So all of a sudden we have like two different flavors of text in there. We have the, um, like the, the white space um, sensitive uh, structured text, and then all of a sudden we have some more symbol oriented thing. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't think that's a good idea. I think keeping with the style we had before is better. So, personally, I prefer to write like this. And also, I don't have parentheses here. And also, as a bonus, now we can uh, be more uh, emotional with our text and have uh, exclamation marks in there. Yes, Eric? So, but now you run immediately in the kind of escape problems. What if the text is animate, appear, click? <laughs> yes, that is also not supported. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to talk about the first rule of using animations. It don't talk about animations. So, uh, DSL design is not easy. Well, if the, uh, the word animate is in blue, then it's a... Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. It's in yellow, isn't it? Yeah. Perhaps we could introduce a symbol for escaping things then. But if you do slides, you want to have different colors too for your text. Mm. Not just uh, black and white slides. <laughs> um, tick, uh, as in PowerShell, or... Hmm? Okay. Uh, symbols. But hey, let's, let's try something else. Uh, Perhaps instead of uh, using that short form of describing an animation, why not use natural language? So why shouldn't it say something like text per god is animated using fly in and triggered by click with duration 0.5 seconds? What do you think about that? Why fly in and quotes and click now? <laughs> <laughs> it's because there's a white space, and I will get back to that. Too hard to remember. It's hard, this, this hard to remember, but any other comments? But what if you said is animated with? Uh, so there's, um, exactly, there's the, the choice of words, yeah. Anything else? But easy to understand for a known programmer, I suppose. Easy to understand, yes, because it's quite obvious what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you going to have the same challenge like you have in all the adventure games, text-based adventure games, where you need to 
you as the player in that case needs to describe what you want to do and the game will need to treat that and understand you know, mm. the different wordings and stuff like that. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of challenges here. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes you're using passive voice here, right? Maybe you say animate the text, like, you know, this is kind of not a good writing style if you, if you write. So, so now I'm getting criticized with my writing style as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... <laughs> I didn't expect this. Uh, is it now that I should do the dance or... <laughs> yeah? The maracas, right. Yeah. Do I need to close the lid first. Um, so we have the choice of active or passive style. There's a lot of... I mean, when we go to natural language, um, we, uh, we open up a can of worms, uh, of course. Uh, Martin Fowler says, don't try to make the DSL read like natural language. We will have a lot of syntactic sugar, which complicates understanding of the semantics. Trying to make a programming language look like natural language puts your head in the wrong context. Meaning that if we write uh, a domain-specific language, the goal is to instruct a computer to do something. But if we, if we use natural language, we, our head gets into a like, communication with people context, which is a different thing. Uh, Dijkstra, 1975, said projects promoting programming in natural language are intrinsically doomed to fail. But then there was another guy, Nelson, who uh, has created a DSL for interactive fiction, which is very interesting, interesting, I think. One reason for COBOL's unexpected survival into the 21st century is that developers can still understand COBOL programs written in the 70s. COBOL's priority of intelligibility over economy acts as something of a preservative against code rusting. So if you look at a COBOL program written 40 years ago, you can still understand it because it's like natural language. Still, the challenges we have, it's easy to read, but can we really write it? So text testing is animated using fly-in with duration 0.5 seconds triggered by click. Is this the same that I had before? No, it isn't. It's, this is different. But how do you remember which one to use? There are, I mean, a lot of different ways of combining these words. And also, we're subject to grammar considerations. Should it be and is triggered? Should it be has duration? And Martin, you said with here. So, I mean, it, again, it becomes very, very complex. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Did I mention that every time I program PowerShell I fail because <laughs> I don't remember how, how to do it? Now English and other languages as well are complex and ambiguous. And uh, originally this text said it makes parsing hard. And Marcus said no, it makes it very hard. So why should we go there? Um, I found, are there any Mac fanboys or fangirls here? <laughs> I think there are a lot of uh, shy fanboys and fangirls, yes. So do you use Apple Script a lot? No? But if you were, you would write code like this. To check for your number from bottom through top. If bottom... This is cute, of course. This symbol is, is good. And then you would call it by saying, this is an event handler. Uh, normally an event handler would, would have on, but you can also use two. Um, and then you call it by saying check for 8 from 7 through 10. Uh, I, I wouldn't remember uh, how to, to write code like this. But then again, I'm not a Mac user, so, <laughs> so perhaps that's why. Now, there's another language, which I think is fantastic. It's called the Rockstar language. It's an esoteric language, meaning that it's like um, I, I recommend you to look for esoteric languages on Wikipedia. Uh, there are languages where the language authors are just pushing the limits to try to see what can we do uh, in terms of language. Uh, or people are just making language, languages for fun. For example, to create a language that is very hard to use. Can you read the text down here? I can read it out loud. So this is... <laughs> um, I will read it out loud. <laughs> and it says, Midnight takes your heart and your soul. While your heart is as high as your soul, put your heart without your soul into your heart. Give back your heart. <laughs> Do you know what this is? Well, it's a wild 
it's a, a while. Yeah. Yes, it's a while inside uh, a inside a function. So we have a function called midnight, which takes two parameters, your heart and your soul. It turns a difference. Sorry? Um. Yeah, now, and while your heart is greater than or equal to your soul, then we say your heart uh, minus, your heart equals um, your heart minus your soul, and then return your heart. So if we get in like uh, uh, 5 and 2, then we would say while 5 is greater than or equal to 2, we subtract 2 from 5, and we get 3, and then we get 1. So it's a modulus function, basically. Um, Beautiful. Beautiful, right? Um, let's see. It's designed for creating computer programs that are also song lyrics. Uh, it's a joke, uh, I think. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's also serious because the author says that if we can make Rockstar a mainstream language, then recruiters can't look for Rockstar developers because then they would have to know Rockstar. <laughs> so there's a hidden agenda here. But there are some interesting ideas, and uh, this is what I like. It's, uh, take it as a joke, but, but uh, we can get inspired by them, anyway. And, and one such thing is white space variables. So Eric asked before, why do we put quotes around the, uh, some of the text? And in Rockstar, you don't have to do that, because in Rockstar, there's something called a proper variable. And a proper variable is something that is not a reserved keyword that begins with an uppercase letter. And then it can contain a white space, and as long as the next word also has an uppercase letter, then it's sort of part of the variable name. So we can have a variable called Dr. Feelgood. This is the name of a variable, and it has white space in there. And I mean, this is great if you're going to use, create a, a natural language DSL, because now you don't need those quotes anymore. You can just use this. I like that very much. But of course, even Rockstar has limitations. Um, for example, if you're going to do arithmetic operations, multiplying numbers and such things, uh, you would think that you could say by. But they disallow by, because it's really unclear if we say 10 by 4, do we mean 10 times 4? Or do we really mean 10 divided by 4? Which give quite different results. So they actually decided that by is not a good alias to use for arith arithmetic operations, because it's, amb it's uh, ambiguous. Um, okay, should we use it? Um, with it, I don't mean Rockstar, uh, I mean um, natural languages. It may be tempting, because if, you, if we want to optimize for readability, I mean, it's, it's pretty readable. But if we also want to think about the mental health of our DSL programmers, then perhaps um, it's not a good idea. Um, I don't think it's worth it. Uh, I mean, it becomes, uh, due to all the ambiguity and, and uh, complications that may arise from using it. Um, but uh, actually, if you think about it, reading it might also be, be a bit problematic. If you go back to CoffeeScript, um, uh, Frederick, you mentioned before that you're a CoffeeScript programmer now. Um, what does foobar and hello world transpile to in JavaScript? The rest of you can answer as well. Anyone? So this is valid CoffeeScript. As long as, of course, foo and bar and hello and world are um, like variables or functions or something. What does this compile to? Ooh, who should I choose? <laughs> so many hands. No one? It would one? be a logical statement calling uh, foo with bar as a variable and hello uh, hello with world as a variable. Like that? <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> so what the phrase said that we call foo with bar as a variable and hello. That was what you meant, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good, Frederick. So. But uh, perhaps for some of you this wasn't really obvious. Uh, th though this is, I mean, very readable. But it's hard for us to know what does this, this really mean. Um, okay, so natural language uh, leads to localization. And of course, uh, if our domain is in a particular language, then we should use that language. Because translating domain terms 
may be very difficult. It may be difficult to find good translations for terms which are very, very specific for a, a language. Um, in domain-driven design terms, we talk about a ubiquitous language. You may mention it before, that we use the same terminology everywhere. And if you talk to your domain experts in Swedish and they use Swedish terms, then it's a good idea to use those in code as well. Uh, localization is about translating, though, to adapt to another language or region. So you have something in English and you translate it to French or Japanese or something else. But the consequences of localization uh, are a few. First of all, I think we should never mix languages. So if we have a language, it's in English, and we use small stop words like is and a and the, and we want to translate to Swedish, then we need to translate those as well. The problem is that now the grammar may be completely wrong, because as you know, different languages have different grammars. In German, for example, they put verb last something. I'm looking at you, Marcus. On the ground, I'm, such I'm a German. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because you're. A, um, so 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 I mean we we then. If we do this, then all of a sudden we need to think about our grammar again. Do we need to change the, the, um, uh, the sequence in which we, we have different uh, expressions in our language? I also think that um, if we do a translation and, and localization, we should use the full character set. Because I have seen examples uh, where that was not the case. So uh, many years ago I visited a client and I read their code and it um, they had this, kohanteran, hmm. and uh, uh, it was very, very, um, I was very confused because there, uh, I couldn't really get why is this in the code until I realized that what, what they meant was kohanteran. <laughs> and kohanteran uh, is a manager of queues, whereas kohanteran is a manager of cows. So, and their domain wasn't about cattle at all. So they, they had a Swedish uh, domain, they used Swedish words, but they didn't use uh, the full character set, which would just open up for a lot of confusion. Um, so, do I really have five minutes left? This says eight. Um, or was you, did your time count in my 50 minutes? Uh, this, is, this is not fair, I think. <laughs> so, um, uh, have you used Excel, anyone? They have localized formulas. So if you're in Excel, uh, if you use Excel in English and you use a VLOOKUP formula to do a vertical lookup, and then you help someone with a Swedish uh, Excel, then you would have to type letterad. And this is very confusing because now you don't know what to type. Uh, it's extremely uh, hard to help someone with a, a, a different version of a different an Excel in a different language. Uh, the good thing, though, is that the grammar doesn't change. The formulas are, are uh, built up in the same way. So there's that. Okay, so numbers. Uh, it's also a part of the localization problem. Pi in English, 3.14. In Swedish, we use a comma, 3 comma, 14, 15, and so on. Uh, a billion in English, in modern English at least, is uh, one followed by uh, nine zeros. And uh, English uses this comma as a thousand separator. Uh, and a billion på svenska, uh, that is uh, one trillion in English. So we have space as a separator and we have 12 zeros after the, the one. So numbers are also complicated and if you are going to translate something, then of course numbers, dates, everything needs to go into the other language. Otherwise you're just half translating it. And if we change uh, period to comma, then of course, if we use comma as a delimiter somewhere, we need to change that to semicolon. And if you have used CSV, CSV files somewhere, sometime, have you used that, CSV files? And save them on uh, Swedish Excel, and then you get a semicolon separated file instead, which is just uh, super confusing. And then you send that to one, someone with an English uh, Excel, and, uh, and nothing works. No, what we should do is probably to use Rockstar. So, to initialize Tommy with the value 14,487, we just write Tommy was a lean mean wrecking machine. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, afterwards, bonus points to whoever can understand why it's correct. Okay. Um, I think that the presentation domain is not language specific. So, uh, 
I'm just going to stick with English. Um, though the syntax, of course, if we just use a keyword like um, slide and the text, then that works in other languages. You wouldn't have to change the grammar. But we use some numbers to express animation duration, so I want to keep it simple and uh, stick to, to English and English numbers. Okay. Um, the good thing, because what we looked at are different languages, some of which are not DSLs, but rather general purpose languages. And the good thing is that a DSL, a domain specific language, is not a general purpose language. So when we design a DSL for a small domain, for a specific problem domain, that's quite different from designing a general purpose language in which you can write any program. In a DSL, there are fewer things to consider. So in a general purpose language, uh, we can express a wide range of application domains and we can cover many abstraction levels and it's complex. Complex meaning that it consists of multiple parts that interact with each other. And this is very very difficult of course um, and all the things that I've talked about are like 10 hundred times more difficult in a general purpose language than in a domain specific language. Um, in a domain specific language, we have a smaller set of programs that we can express. We don't have to be Turing complete. We can, of course, but uh, in, in my presentation DSL, I don't plan on having control structures. So I don't plan on having loops and if statements and things like that, which simplifies the problem very much. Uh, and also I have a lot smaller target audience. I'm not writing a language to be consumed by all the developers in the world, only the people who want to create presentations in a better way. Um, so a domain specific language, language can remove noise uh, and allow people to focus on the valuable, thing, valuable things, provide a good abstraction for what we're trying to do, and it can also limit the programmer. And limitation in this context is good because if we limit the programmer then there's less risk that the programmer makes an error. And there are fewer ways of doing something uh, uh, unlike PowerShell. Uh, soon, Eric, I'm seeing, I see you have your hand up. Uh, and we can lead the programmer on the right path. Yes, Eric. So, like for example, in your presentation DSL, if you find that you write the same stuff over and over again, don't you want to have, like, you know, introduce a mechanism to that, like, abbreviate that? And and then you see that you write the same thing over and over again, but just a little bit different. Now maybe don't you want to parameterize that? Um, and all of a sudden, yeah. And by then you have actually got like full Turing completeness. Yes. I wonder what my presentations would look like if I write the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I, let me think about that. Uh, my point here is, is uh, that we have different contexts, domain specific language, contra general purpose language, uh, and there are like different rules. So um, natural language, for example, very difficult in a general purpose language, but in a small DSL, maybe we can make it work if we're like somewhat strict about it. Verbosity, I think it's good in the DSL because it gives clarity to the reader. In a GPL, I want it to be concise. We need to think about this when we design. Okay, my time is up. Uh, I just want to give you um, like a, a summary. Uh, I think it's in a DSL important to optimize for readability over writability. I think readability is, uh, is more important, so I think we can afford to be a little bit verbose in the DSL because it, it helps the reader a lot, even though the programmer has to type a little bit more. I think symbols are good. We should be careful when using them, not overuse, and also make sure that the symbols that we use are like good for the target audience, so that the people using the DSL know what the symbols mean and are familiar with them. I think we should be careful with using natural language. It opens up a can of worms, um, and I, I wouldn't do it. Um, I think using the language of the domain is the correct thing to do. I think translating into other languages is uh, complicated and something I'd like to avoid. And don't try to make a general purpose language. Uh, I think people in here have made that and I, I respect them for that, but I wouldn't, uh, I, I think I wouldn't go there. Um, 
Or perhaps I should say this, if you're making a DSL, don't try to make it into a general purpose language, stay in the DSL word. That's perhaps a more correct way of, of expressing it. And finally, know the target audience, know their context, know where they're coming from, what they think is good and bad, and which symbols they use. That's it. Thank you for listening. Okay.